This is Wayne Dyer. I'd like to share with you a powerful secret. One that has the ability to transform your life in ways that you probably can't even begin to imagine. You have the innate power to attract to yourself anything you want in life. This is a very strange yet a powerful idea. You, you have the power to attract to yourself anything you want in life. This power lies deep within the recesses of your soul and is only accessible through the workings of your highest self. In this program, I'll lead you on a journey to this mysterious territory, and I'm going to reveal ancient spiritual teachings that will help guide you to the truth of your own divinity and begin to reveal the secrets to manifesting anything you desire. I always like the metaphor of standing on a cliff and down below is an abyss. And this abyss is endless. And I think of our lives as like we're standing there and we know that this is all unknown territory. And it's like we jump, perhaps, but when we jump, there's like a rock that goes with us and we hang onto this rock. And we're grabbing it and holding on to it and we're falling and we're being carried someplace that we're not quite sure where we're headed, which is sort of what our life is like. And we just hang on to this thing, this rock, whatever it might be, our reality, if you will, or our past, and we cling to it and we cling to it and we cling to it so strongly because we're afraid if we let go, who knows what could happen. And then there comes a moment or a time when you realize this thing isn't doing you any good. This thing that is your past, this thing that is all your teachings, this thing is that you're so familiar with that you don't want to let go of it, but you're not quite sure why you're hanging on to it. And then there comes a moment when you realize, hey, I can let go of this thing, and it doesn't really change anything. That's sort of the way I feel about entering into this whole territory of being able to manifest. And when I talk about manifesting, I'm really talking about the ability to take what it is that we think about that's in the world of our thoughts and to be able to have the power to bring that into the world of our daily experience called the physical world, whatever that might be. I uh, wrote a book a few years ago called Your Sacred Self. And in The Sacred Self, I talk about the two parts of us, if you will. There's one part of us that is an idea, and it's, we call it the ego. And this idea is that who I am is separate and who I am is special and who I am is important. And the key word is separate, who I am is separate from others. In other words, where I begin and where you stop is what separates us. So that you and I are not the same according to this ego because you're in a different body than I am and you stop there, and there's your boundaries, and here are my boundaries here, and we've come to believe in this sort of separateness part of us. But then there's another part of us, an idea also, that says, I don't care about separation. I am in a different world. I don't have any boundaries. That's this part of me that is looking out, if you will. And this part I call the sacred self, or the highest self. And this part of us only wants one thing, it doesn't care whether we're right, which is the ego is very concerned about that. It doesn't care whether we're better than, it doesn't care what we look like. It doesn't care about any of the physical characteristics that we have come to identify as ourself. This higher part of ourself only wants one thing, and that thing that it wants is for us to be at peace. So that whenever you're questioning whether or not it's your higher self, or your sacred part of you, or the ego part of you, that is motivating me at any particular moment, the question to ask yourself is, is this going to bring me peace? And if the answer to that is yes, it's going to bring me peace, then you listen to that higher part of you. If the answer to that is no, it's going to bring me turmoil, it's going to create problems for me, I'm going to end up in an argument, I'm not going to be happy if I do this, whatever, I'm not going to be healthy if I do this, this isn't going to work for me, then it's the ego, the part of us that believes that we are separate from. Now, this key word in, in knowing and living from the highest self is separation. That's the key word, separation. 
that somehow we have come to really endorse this idea that I am separate from, from God, that I am separate from my fellow man, and that I am separate from my environment, and that overcoming this and living from a different perspective. One of the things that I have worked and worked and worked on in my own life, and I still continue to work on it every day, and in my own relationship with my wife and with my children particularly, is this idea of allowing this higher part of myself that just wants me to be at peace, just wants peace and nothing else, to play more of a dominant role to tame this part of me that is so concerned with my self-importance and with being right and with proving somebody else to be wrong and with being offended and, and all of the stuff, the turmoil that we live with and create because of this reliance on this ego. So knowing that we have a higher self or a highest self really means detaching ourselves from a lot of the things that we have come to believe is who we are. Now, the beliefs that we have, that we've grown up with, that we've practiced all of our daily rituals on, is what I call the tribe thinking, the thinking of the tribe. You see, all of us are members of a tribe. And that tribe might be your immediate family, it might be the ethnic group to which you belong, it might be the people who share the same color of skin that you happen to uh, have. It may be people who have the same philosophical points of view or political points of view or religious points of view or people who are related to you genetically in some way, cousins and aunts and uncles and so on. Anyway, there's this tribe that we sort of are born into, if you will. And the tribe evolves at a certain speed. So that as a tribe, as a people, we have evolved from hunters and gatherers, if you will, to people who now have computer chips and people who can just go in and have our meat and our vegetables just arranged for us in cellophane in packaging in department stores. There's been an evolution. The tribe has evolved so that most places on the planet, people can get fresh drinking water by just turning a knob. There was a time when they had to dig holes, right, and, and try to find it. So the evolution of the tribe is in place, but it moves very slowly. It takes a long, long, long time for the tribe to evolve. What I'm talking about here, when you come to know your highest self and to live by it, is leaving the tribe and leaving tribal consciousness. You see, to be an individual... When you go to the tribe and you tell them, I've discovered something, I've discovered something that's about manifesting, you know, and I'm going to really practice this and I'm going to do this, and I know I can do this. Jesus said we can do this. Sai Baba told us we can do this. You know, Muktananda tells us we can do this. I'm going to do this. The tribe immediately goes, wait a second here. <laughs> what are you doing? We don't want any individuals in this tribe. That's the purpose of the tribe is to keep individual people from surfacing. It's to keep it down. It's to have... If What I'm saying to you is that if you're going to learn manifesting and you're going to understand your highest self, you have to somehow figure out a way to let go of this idea that the tribe is going to give me approval or that I'm going to do it within the parameters that the tribe has uh, dictated. Because what you're doing when you're learning to manifest or when you're learning anything that is outside of the restricted parameters of the tribe, what you are doing is you are speeding up the evolution of your awareness and your consciousness. You are saying, I am going to evolve at a faster rate. But if you go to the tribe and tell them that, immediately you're going to get put into your place. You see, the mantra of the tribe is... But what will they think? <laughs> That's the mantra of the tribe. What, are they, what, what, is everybody, what are they going to think of me? And the minute that you start playing that game of what are they going to think, you have stopped yourself from being able to evolve at a faster rate of speed. Later on, you'll hear me talking about the importance of uh, 
of privacy in your manifesting, that you don't share this with other people. You don't go talking about it. I happen to be talking about it because I'm trying to encourage you to do it. But I don't, when I decide that I want to manifest something, when I put my attention on that, that's a very private matter between me and God. The reason that you don't share it is because it takes the energy away from what you are doing and puts it on the attention of the person that you're trying to convince. Immediately you get ego in there. And the minute that you get ego in there, you shut down the energy. You shift. So leaving the tribe and the tribal consciousness is really what you're saying is if I'm going to evolve at the speed at which the tribe is evolving, you're saying I'm going to evolve, but I'm going to do it very, very slowly. And if you want to manifest, if you want to really become a manifester in your life, you don't have enough time in this lifetime. You've got to come back in 19 lifetimes. Right? You don't have enough time for that. So it's almost like getting out of that consciousness. When the question was asked of Dr. Maslow, when I asked him this question personally, what does it mean to be self-actualized? He said there are three things that you have to know and understand. One is you have to learn to become independent of the good opinion of other people. That's like at the top of the list. You have to become independent. Self-actualizers are independent of the good opinion of other people. Secondly, self-actualizers are people who have no attachment to the outcome. They are detached from the fruits of their labors. They know what their life is about, and they get on with that and they don't get themselves concerned with how it's going to work out. They turn that over to God. They just have this knowing that it will, and that's enough. And the third is that they have no investment in power over other people. No investment in power over other people. So they're not really trying to convince anybody else or to subjugate anybody else or to dominate anyone else with their abilities. And these people who have these divine capacities are usually very, very quiet about it. And they will get disapproval, and they will acknowledge it, and it's okay. They just move along. They don't allow that to be the focus of what it is that they're going to do in their lives. I can't tell you how many people, but it's up in the hundreds of thousands, that have written to me over the past quarter of a century and told me their difficulties, their struggles, and how if they would have learned one of these three lessons, or all three of these lessons, to be independent of the good opinion of other people, to be detached from the outcome, and to get rid of your investment in the need to have power over other people, how much peace you would have in your life. There's an affirmation in The Course in Miracles that says, I can choose peace rather than this. I can choose peace rather than this, at any given moment. Now remember, peace is what enlightenment is. Enlightenment means to be surrounded by and immersed in peace at all moments in your life. The higher part of you only wants you to be at peace. So the part of you that needs to be at peace, that wants to be at peace, very often is overcome and dominated by the part of you that believes that you're separate and that you're special and that you're important, and that who you are is this physical body that you showed up in. So what I'd like to do here is just have you imagine that you're in a room. And in this room, you're with your back to a wall, and you're looking out at this empty room. And everything to your right represents that which you notice, that's what you perceive, that which what you see in the physical world. Everything over here on the right-hand side represents the physical world with all of its boundaries, with all of the stuff that you would like to be able to manifest in the world and all that you have manifested, including your bank account, including your body, including your children, including all of your friends, your automobiles, your clothes, everything that you can see in the physical world is over here on the right-hand side of the room. And then I'd like you to visualize or imagine on the left-hand side of the room is everything that causes that which is on the right-hand side. 
the cause of everything on the right-hand side. The manifestation of anything into the physical world is the result of a divine idea. The left-hand side of the room represents divine ideas. How does something get into the physical world? It has a force, a God force of some kind in it. And it doesn't matter what you call this force, whether you call it soul or spirit or consciousness or God or Christ or Buddha, what doesn't make any difference, the label, the name that we place on this energy or this force, but it is in everything that is over here and it is the cause of everything over on the right. Okay? I remember when I was a little boy and I was living out in Mount Clemens, Michigan at this home and this lady's name was Mrs. Scarf and on the right-hand side of the driveway coming up uh, there was this great big patch of uh, dirt and she planted lilies of the valley. And they were so beautiful, these lilies of the valley. I, every time I smell a lilies of the valley today, I go back to Mount Clemens, to that home that I lived in with Mrs. Scar. And uh, I can remember even buying my wife a bottle of, I was in Kmart, I think it was, and, I, and they had a, a, a perfume called Lily of the Valley. And I brought it home and I said, here, there's a present for you. And she looked, what in the world are you buying me this cheap uh, you know, flower water for? <laughs> I said, it just reminds me of all of this. It's just such a wonderful aroma. So there was lilies of the valleys over here. And on the left-hand side of the driveway coming up was this great big patch of, of dirt. And every year we would plant tomato seeds in uh, the springtime. And I remember Mrs. Scarf going out there with us and she would have this great big uh, pile of uh, tomato seeds that I think, I believe that she had dried from the year before. And she would take a, a, a sprinkler can full of water and a little uh, digger, <laughs> and we would go out and she would dig a little hole and she would pour some of the seeds in there, and then she would take the water and she would pour the water on top of them and cover it up. And she'd say to us, and I was maybe four years old, um, I would say to her, uh, where do the tomatoes come from? And she'd say, oh, uh, God will give us the tomatoes. Now, that was okay for everybody else that was living there, but for me, it's like I wanted to know a little bit more than that. I'd say, what, what do you mean God will give us the tomatoes? I'd say, what, are there tomatoes in those seeds or not? And she'd say, no, there's really no tomatoes in the seeds. I'd say, well, what's in the seed? To give us the tomatoes. What, what's in there? How does a tomato come out of that? She'd say... Just, you know, she'd get real flustered, and she said, just, just watch, you know, just watch. You'll see, it'll happen. I'd say, yeah, but... And so I can remember stealing a few of the tomato seeds and putting them in my little blue jean pockets and going back behind this chicken coop that we had out there, and they had a little paring knife on the table there where they cleaned these chickens. At, uh, and uh, I took the paring knife, and I can remember this like it was yesterday, cutting open the tomato seeds, just like opening them up and looking in there for something like little tiny, I guess I was looking for miniature tomatoes, you know, <laughs> just something that would resemble a tomato. And all there was in there was this dust. It was just brown dust inside of that. And it was like I would just be flabbergasted that brown dust could produce these red tomatoes in just a matter of months. So... The question is, what is it that causes these tomatoes? How do these tomatoes get manifested, if you will, into the physical world? And the answer to that is that there is a force that is invisible, that has no boundaries and no parameters and nothing that you can get a hold of, that is what we would call a future pull. It's tomato potential if you will. Potentiality. All that's in there is a potentiality. And yet that potentiality that's in that seed that you can't see, when it is nurtured, becomes these tomatoes. So that the cause of tomato is not necessarily in tomato itself, but in a potentiality for tomato-ness. Right? <laughs> <laughs> to talk about it in those terms. Now, this happens to be true for everything that's in the physical domain, including you. At one time, each and every one of us was just a, a bunch of brown dust. Now, the interesting thing is, if you take that dust, that brown dust from the tomatoes, or that little 
speck of human protoplasm that collides with another that creates this little fetus that ultimately becomes you, if you take that dust and examine it under a microscope, you discover that it's just all kinds of tiny little what we call subatomic particles. First you get molecules, then you get atoms, then you get electrons and neutrons and croutons and whatever else is in there. <laughs> and then ultimately you take those little protons and neutrons and croutons and you break them down further and you come up uh, with these subatomic particles and then you get a real strong electron microscope and you look at the uh, subatomic particle under the microscope and you discover that there are, there's nothing there. You keep breaking it down and breaking it down and ultimately you just get a wave. You just get an energy. It's like it's spaces, spaces, and then you take the spaces away, take the particle, then you take that particle, and you look at it stronger, more magnification, take that away, take the spaces out, until you've taken all the spaces out, and that's all that's left is space. So that there is something called energy, or spaciness, or whatever you want to call it, this uh, potentiality that is the source of everything in the physical domain. What I'm suggesting to you, as you imagine yourself with your back against this wall and thinking of everything over here on the right that is manifested and everything over here on the left that is the potential for manifesting, is that we have given up our ability, we have forfeited our ability to oscillate to go back and forth between the world over here on the right, that is the physical world, and this world over here on the left, which is the cause of it. We think we can't get in here. And once we learn how to get into this world over here, which is the world of creation, and what are the mechanics of this, then we can put our attention, which is nothing more than that inner world, which has no boundaries to it, on what it is that we would like to see manifested and we can co-create whatever it is we want to put our attention on using these nine principles. And it works. You become a co-creator with God rather than someone who is separate from God. So, as a co-creator or as someone who can get into this world over here, into the world of creation, the invisible world, you can learn to go there. That's what meditation is about. You can transcend the duality of the physical plane, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. So this whole idea of, first of all, getting out of the tribal mindset, which is a mindset that says, do it slowly, do it the way everybody else does, and if you want to be your own person, your own individual, the tribe is going to do everything it can to suppress those kinds of ideas. So you understand that you came into the tribe in order to be able to learn how to leave it. And then, how to be able to know this higher part of you as something that just wants to be at peace. That's all it wants. It doesn't care whether you're right or wrong, whether you're better than anybody else, how much you get, what you look like how old you are, how young you are, because it is ageless and timeless and in a different dimension altogether. This part of you that is looking out and observing and noticing. And then you go past your forfeiture of your ability to get out of the physical world. You cannot learn to manifest if you're stuck in the physical plane. You've got to be able to leave it. That's what metaphysical means, to go beyond the physical. That's what transformation means. You've got to be able to transcend, to go past your form. You, as long as you're stuck hanging onto that rock that you were hanging onto in the abyss, which is your past and all these beliefs and all these things that are handed to you, as long as you continue to cling to that, which is the tribe, the rock is the tribe, and all of the beliefs of the tribe, as long as you continue to hang on to that, you will never get to know your highest self. Or you'll only get to know, you'll only get glimpses of it. Maybe on Sunday morning. Maybe when you read a particular book or you attend a particular lecture. Or maybe you listen to a tape or something. But then to be able to go out into the world and to begin to apply it, you're instantly, your tribal conditioning says, you can't do that. 
You can't do that. So I'm trying to shift that. And when I shift into this part over here, I can put my attention over here on virtually anything in the physical domain. And by using divine principles, have it manifest as I would like it to manifest. The greatest fear that we have, it seems to me, is our fear that we're alone or of being alone. People fear this idea of that I am really alone. I mean, did you ever stop and think about, like, dying? You know, like, you know you're going to die, right? I mean, we all know this. Everybody, even if you read Deepak's books and you know that it's ageless body and so on, there's still a part of you that says everything in the physical domain is in transition. So even if I can figure out a million years, <laughs> you know, there's still going to come a time. You know, that's why I always been think about the real health food fanatics, you know, the ones who eat tofu and do everything exactly the way they're supposed to do. You know, I wonder what's going to happen to them someday when they're all in a hospital bed and they're all, you know, dying, you know, and they're dying from nothing. You know, it's like, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Nothing. <laughs> You're just dying. <laughs> when, when you think about this concept of dying, isn't the most fearful thing, didn't you do this when you were a kid? I certainly did. And I think about, okay, let's just say I'm going to be dead a thousand years. I can handle that. But forever? And that whole concept of forever, and it's like never, and a billion years is going to go, and you go, ah, it's just too much. You just, oh, you push that out. But you see, there's a part of you, even though it isn't well-trained, there's a part of you that knows that you're eternal, that can never die. The part of you that's been with you since you were a little child. The part of you that looks out. You know, I was giving a talk up in Boston not too long ago, and uh, my wife was with me, and I finished running, and it was in the morning, and it was about 5, 30, 6 o'clock. It was just a real beautiful morning, a nice, cool, crisp morning in March up in Massachusetts, and I was running on a, a track across the street from the uh, high school, and uh, the uh, hotel, my wife was standing in front of the hotel, saying, come on, let's go to breakfast, and I had just finished running, and, and she was waving to me. She said, come on, come on, we've got to go. You've been out there for two hours. For quite a while. Come on. And so I, I, there was a fence between her and I, and I was running towards her, and I saw this fence, and the fence was about three and a half, maybe four feet high. And when I was in high school, I was a high jumper on the team, so four, a four-foot jump isn't a really big deal. And I ran up to the fence, and I hurtled over the fence. I just jumped the fence. And she screamed at me. She said, you can't do that. You're 55 years old. When you're 55 years old, you don't jump over fences. You're going to kill yourself. <laughs> and I said, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I forgot. Because the part of me that has been in there looking out has never aged. It hasn't aged at all. It's the part of me that doesn't know anything about age. I mean, I look in the mirror, and I look back, and I see hairs falling out, you know. And I ask that metaphysical question, you know, what held it in yesterday? You know, I, <laughs> you know, something did. I don't know what it is. But there's a little boy in there, and there's a teenager in there, and there's a 30-year-old in there, and there's a 40-year-old in there. And I was walking along the beach not too long, and I saw this man. He was well into his 90s. I mean, he was like creaking along in the beach. And this woman walked by with this thong bathing suit on. <laughs> Gorgeous, you know. And he was walking, walking, and all of a sudden when she went by him, he turned and he went, ah, and he looked. <laughs> I could hurt his neck to look. But he had to look. <laughs> and I said, it's a life sentence, you know. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't know. I mean, the part of him that is looking and observing and noticing, the part that's over here on the left-hand side, hasn't aged at all. It's just the package that has. So the highest self is this. This fear of being alone, this idea that we're alone, when you know, as it said in The Course in Miracles, as I said earlier, if you knew who walked beside you at all times, if you knew that there is a force that is with you and walking with you at all times, you would transcend that idea, that fear that you're alone, and you would know it. Carl Jung, who spent a good part of his life studying these ideas, who was a great teacher in my life, studied these ideas, and when he was dying, he was asked, do you believe there's life after death? Because he had studied about this and written about this, and he said, no. He said, I don't believe that. I know it. 
I absolutely know it. There is no doubt, you see. Because Jung said there are really four stages, if you will, or what he called archetypes, that we all go through as adults. And many of you listening here today on this program will recognize that the emphasis that I have placed uh, over the years has shifted and often ask why. And when I'm asked that question in, in interviews, I always say to the interviewer, it's because I have been through these stages, these archetypes. The lowest stage is what he called the stage of the athlete. And the stage of the athlete is a stage in which it's the time in our lives. This is not a put-down of athletes, by the way, or athletics. It's just a, an archetype for the time in our lives when our primary emphasis is on our uh, physical appearance, what it looks like, how strong it is, how much it can lift, and so on, how fast it can run. It's the stage of our preoccupation with our physical body, how beautiful it is, how attractive it is. This is a lot of looking in the mirror time and so on in our lives. And I can remember being there in my life and having this as the primary focus of my life. What does my body look like? And I am this body. He said the second stage, the second archetype, is what he called the stage of the warrior. And he said this is the time in your adult life when you take your physical body out into the world and do with it what warriors do. And what warriors do is they conquer, they defeat, they compare. This is the age of the ego. This is the time in your adult life now when you put your attention on what's in it for me, what are my quotas, how much can I get, who am I better than. This is the time of we're number one. You see all, all of that uh, all over the country, especially during football season with the kids. Putting, we're number one, we're number one. It's the idea of having to compare yourself, of thinking about getting yours before somebody else gets it, that you're in competition with everyone else. There's only so much abundance. There's only so much that I can have in my life, and I have to get it before somebody else gets it. And if I don't, then they're going to get it, and so on. And so I have to defeat other people. It's the age of uh, the ego. It's the time in our lives when we learn separation. I am separate from you. I am separate from everyone out there, and I have to get mine. Then the third stage is what Jung called the stage of the statesman. And this is the time in our adult lives when we shift our emphasis out of what's in it for me and stop asking the question, what are my quotas? And we begin to say, what are yours? And how may I serve becomes your mantra. And here is when you begin to have that paradox that you begin to understand that all the things that you sought after when you were an athlete and when you were a warrior begin to show up in your life when you're a statesman in even larger numbers, but they show up in a way in which you're no longer attached to them. It's like, it's okay. The abundance shows up and you say, yeah, that's fine, and you let it flow because the nature of this uh, divine organizing intelligence that is over on the left side of the room, this future pull, this potentiality, this part of you, this higher part of you, is one which has no boundaries to it. And it is not attached to holding on to anything. And so as a statesman, you begin to put your attention on serving others. And companies that do this tend to flourish much more than those who are most concerned about the bottom line. It's the time in our lives when we... Uh, Stop thinking about how much can I get from somebody else and instead say, here, can you take, would you like some of mine? And then we find out when we do that that more comes into our lives. And then uh, Jung said that the highest stage, what he called the stage of the uh, spirit, is the time in our adult lives when ultimately we begin to realize that we're none of the previous three. That we are not athletes, we're not warriors, we're not statesmen at all that in fact we're not even human beings having a spiritual experience. Indeed, that it's the other way around, that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And the quality of our human experience is one in which we can recognize our own divinity. And we know that this is not our home. We are, as Jesus said in the New Testament, we are in this world, but we're not of this world.
And we come to know this. And therefore, we are capable of being in the world, filling out the forms, and doing whatever it is that we do in our lives, and recognizing at all times that we are not of this world. This is the time when we shift our awareness off of me and begin to get over here on the left-hand side and notice me. I now am no longer what I notice. I am the noticer. I no longer am what I witness. I am the witness. I'm no longer what I observe. I am the observer. And as you do this, you begin to live from the highest place. You're no longer the athlete, even though you might be athletic. You're no longer the warrior, even though you might be very competitive and you might have a whole lot of goals that you are working on. But that isn't your primary identification. You're not even the statesman who is serving and working to make the world a better place. You are that which is eternal. That which is always there. Never ages, never dies, has no boundaries, and is your highest and your most sacred self. And it isn't just a matter of listening to this tape and saying, yeah, okay, I got that. It's a matter of living from that perspective. Detaching yourself from all that's on the right-hand side of the room, getting over here on the left, and looking over there and saying, how can I participate in manifesting what I desire and still maintain the sacredness of my life? To trust in yourself, what you're really doing is trusting in the very wisdom that created you. And this key word here is trust. The use of the word trust could be used synonymously with faith. This faith to move mountains, this faith to be able to create things for yourself without having that little smidgen of doubt in there. Remember, as it says in Proverbs in the Old Testament, as you think, so shall you be. Your thoughts, of course, create your reality. And the application of this is that if you're doubting, if you're thinking about even the littlest amount of doubt, then that will be what you will work on. You will act upon that inner world of doubt, and you will manifest the result of doubt. And if you doubt something then obviously, you know, as Shakespeare said, our doubts are our traitors. William Blake had a wonderful line. He said, if the sun and moon should ever doubt, they would immediately go out. <laughs> so it's almost like you have to have the faith of the sun and the moon, that you are a divine being that has this divine intelligence within it. And as I talk about trust, it's appropriate to look at the characteristics of this uh, thing that has many names. The God Force, the Spirit, the Invisible Intelligence, the Soul, the Consciousness, the Awareness. Whatever name or label that we place on it, it has certain characteristics. And it's a very, this is a very tough area for us to master because our egos the part of us that are rooted in the physical domain, really strongly believe in our separateness from each other and from God. And because we are so attached to our separateness, it is very hard for us to now begin to trust in a unity kind of consciousness, a consciousness which says that I am much more than that which I observe. I am much more than my troubles. I am much more than that which I notice. As the noticer, I have this divine capacity. So what I'm talking about here is an intelligence or a God force or a divine awareness, whatever you want to call it, that is in all things. It's in that tomato seed. It's in the banana seed. It's in you. It's in everything. Everything starts with an idea. And this idea 
is not in the physical domain. To come to trust in this really means that you have to transcend the ego part of you and say, I have got to learn as an individual, as a particularized part of this divine intelligence, I have to learn about and adopt an intelligence that doesn't know how to particularize. I have to adopt and be a part of an intelligence that is everywhere. That's what universal means. Universal intelligence means there is no place that it is not. Okay? Now, if there's no place that it is not, it means that it is in me. And if it is in me, and there's no place that it is not, it is also in everything that I process or perceive to be missing from my life. It's also in that. So if I would like to be able to manifest abundance of some kind or a relationship or a healing or a seller for my home or a promotion or whatever it is, the intelligence that I am talking about, this universal divine organizing intelligence that is the highest part of, that represents the highest part of you, is in the very thing that is missing. So here's a key line to learn about learning to trust. When you learn to manifest, you are no doing nothing more than manifesting another aspect of yourself. You're manifesting another aspect of yourself. This intelligence doesn't know how to particularize, yet you have got to learn to adopt it and understand it from someone who is convinced that you are an individual who is particularized. You've got to do this with your ego, but yet you've got to transcend the very ego that you're doing it with. And when you do, the ego part of you says, wait a minute, if you get this, you don't need me anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to do everything I can to keep you from destroying the very thing that supports you. So this doubt will surface all the time. Here are the characteristics of the God force, of that force that's in that tomato plant. And it's like, you can practice this, you can, you can see it in, uh, in people. I remember one of the great teachers in my life was uh, Fritz Radl, who wrote a book called Controls from Within, and um, was a student uh, in Vienna. And he taught it uh, in the doctoral program at Wayne State University. And I was really blessed to be in one of his seminars and I remember him uh, coming in one day to this uh, doctoral seminar. There were, I think there were six of us in the seminar. And he um, presented us with this story. He was just a great teacher. He never judged any of us. Everybody, he already said, you're great, you've got an A. You're doctoral students, here's your grade, all right? Now... You can come if you want to come. You don't have to come if you don't want to come. It's up to you. I don't put any emphasis on it. If nobody's here, when I get here on Wednesday evenings, it was a three-hour seminar. He said, I'll just meditate. Yeah. And not one person ever missed a class. I don't think I ever worked harder in a seminar than I worked for this man. He, was, he, just, he wasn't doing what he was doing because he was attached to us doing it the way he thought we should do it. He wanted us to actualize ourselves. And he even said to us, self-actualizing people live from their divine self. They know the divine. And he said, imagine a person who's living at the highest level, who um, comes and shows up at a, uh, at a dinner party. And this dinner party, everyone is dressed in formal attire. Everybody has a suit on, not just a suit, but a black tie. And he said... This person shows up, and he's wearing a pair of jeans, and a baseball cap, and a pair of sneakers, and a t-shirt. And he shows up at this gathering where everyone is dressed in formal attire. He said, the question is, what would he do? <laughs> and he walked out of the room. He said, I'll be back in 15 minutes. Now, each one of us sat there, and we wanted to prove how cool we were. You know, as a young doctoral student, I was 27 years old. And 
I had read this and I had read Maslow and uh, I'd heard of Maslow doing these kind of things and I'd even had an opportunity to meet Dr. Maslow and to study with him, which was a great honor. So I wrote what I thought would be his reaction and each of the rest, the other five of us all did the same. And then he came in and he said, okay, well, Vane, read your answer. And I read uh, what I had written down and each person read it. Most of us wrote something like... Uh, well, he wouldn't leave, and he wouldn't make a big issue of it, and he wouldn't pay attention to that, and, and he's not into appearances, and so he wouldn't be uh, concerned with whether the people liked it or not, and he would be independent of the good opinion of other people. I mean, I had it all down, right? And I gave all what I thought would be the right answers, how cool I would be. And each one of us read it, and then Fitz Radel said, uh, none of you got it. He said, the answer is very simple, three words. He wouldn't notice. Now, it shows you how far we have to go. <laughs> he wouldn't notice. These are people, and this is a level of trust that I'm trying to get you to understand, which is one in which the unfolding of God is what is seen by this person in each one of us and in everything that he sees in the universe. They see the unfolding of God in each person. Not a physique, not a shape, not a color, not a sex, not an occupation, not a socioeconomic classification. None of those things. What they see is the unfolding of God in all things and in all people. And when you get to this place where you're beginning to trust in this wisdom that created you, you're beginning to understand what this force is like and how different it is from the ego, which is the part of us that has separated ourselves from that force and has believed in our own sense of particularization or individualization. Remember, to develop the kind of trust that I'm talking about, you have to be able to process this intellectual fact that there is an intelligence in the universe that doesn't know how to particularize. It doesn't know how to individualize. It has no preferences. It is everywhere at the same time. It has no judgment. It is like electricity. It's just there. It's everywhere and in everything. And being in everything, it's in you and everything that you would like to manifest. So what you're doing as you manifest is just getting another part of yourself to align. When you learn to manifest, what you're doing is you are aligning your intention with divine intelligence. You are aligning your intention with divine intelligence. You are not creating. You are not bringing something from another world into this world. We don't do that. Everything that's in the world is in the world. We just combine things and, and we move things around that are already here. It's all here. The creative process is really nothing more than shifting around what is here already and aligning ourselves with it and redistributing it. And so the characteristics of this divine God force, if you will, is that it is everywhere, it is not particularized, it has no preferences, it has no judgment, it is always flowing, it never changes, and most important, it never dies. It never dies. When Lao Tzu, the writer of the Tao, five centuries before Christ, was asked the question, what is real, Master? What is real? His response was, that is real, which never changes. Somehow, you have to figure out a way to know the part of you that never changes. When I was writing this book called Manifest Your Destiny, I really wanted to um, put in a display quote at the beginning of the book that would sort of uh, 
summarize, if you will, what it was that this book is about and what these ideas are about. And I finished the book. I finished the nine principles. I wrote out how to apply them. I was very happy to have that done. I agreed to do a program that you're listening to based upon these. But I still didn't have a display quote. Like when I wrote Your Sacred Self, I came across a passage in The New Yorker that I really loved. It said, uh, all my life I wanted to be somebody. Now I am finally somebody. But it isn't me. (laughs) (laughs) Because who I am is not that somebody that I thought I was. Who I am is that part of me that is eternal and sacred. And I thought I was something else. I thought that who I could be would be to have a bestseller or to make a lot of money or to be famous or to do The Tonight Show or to do any of the the, the thousands of things that I've been blessed to have come my way. But that's not me. You have to trust in something else. I was over on Maui with my family and uh, I had finished the writing and I had finished my preparation for this. And I took the whole family and three of their friends to this place uh, on Maui to celebrate for two days. It's called the Grand Wailea, which is this really fancy schmancy hotel. And I thought, well, in lieu of sending all the kids to college, we'll spend two nights here (laughs) at the hotel. So it's got all of these water slides and uh, lazy rivers and uh, rope swings and uh, every elevator, everything you could possibly imagine is in there, you know. And um, I was down there and I was sort of watching all the kids doing it with all of their friends and they were having a wonderful time. And suddenly it hit me. The night before I had been in the room and I was thinking about this idea of what can I put at the beginning of this idea about manifesting that will really illustrate what I want to get across. And I said to my wife, I said, I'm going back upstairs because in the room at at the Grand Wailea, they have a lot of Japanese people coming there to this hotel and to Maui, and they had in the bed stand next to the bed, they had two books. They had the Holy Bible, and they had the teachings of Buddha. I had been reading through the teachings of Buddha, and I noted a couple of things in there, and then I was reading through St. John, which always, St. John always intrigues me in the New Testament. And so I, uh, I said, I'm going to go back up there. I know it's there. I know it's there, and I just had another one of those strong inner urges or whatever it is to go back up to the room, even though I'd already checked out. And I went up to one of the rooms that we had uh, rented there, and there were uh, three uh, women in there who didn't speak English. And I asked them if I could just go over to the bedstand, and I think they thought I was going to steal the Bible or something. (laughs) And uh, I said, no, I just want to take this with me to a little room, which was uh, off to the side of the room that we had rented. And I'd like to... uh, just look over it for a little while. And they were just, me, me, I'm not sure, and all of that. And I said, well, I'm going to do that anyway. <laughs> and so I, I took the, the two books there, and I opened up the teachings of Buddha. And in the teachings of Buddha, there was a quote that I really loved. I didn't put it at the, as a display quote, but I, it's really very powerful. And that quote from Buddha is, the only effort of any intelligent person in this world ought to be to know something which cannot be destroyed by death. The only effort of any intelligent person in this world ought to be to know something, not to believe in something, to know something which cannot be destroyed by death. And I wonder if you know something. Know means trust. If you trust in something without any doubt that cannot be destroyed by death, certainly it's not your body or any of your possessions all of which will become dust. Everything on the planet, including you, to put it in Ken Wilber's terms, is tomorrow's food. It's a constant recycling in the physical plane. So what part of you cannot be destroyed by death? What part of you is real, if you will, as Lao Tzu put it? But I knew there was something in the, in the New Testament that really had struck me. So I started going through that, and I had a little paper that I was writing on, and I jotted down these two quotations, and I put them as the display quotes. The first is from John 10, verse 34. It says, Is it not written in your law, I have said, 
you are God's. From Jesus Christ. Is it not written in your law, I have said, you are God's? Which is really what you have to understand and embrace and know if you're going to become a manifester. You have to know what you are being told here by a great spiritual teacher. You are God's. And I was just, I, I said, boy, this is amazing. I was just sent up here off of my rope swing to come up here and write these things down. And the second one was John 14, verse 20, that says, On that day you will know, see how that word know is always there. You won't believe, you will know. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So, what is being talked about here? What is being talked about is not something that is physical. This is not like my arm is in your arm. My spleen is in you. We're talking about here is something that is beyond the physical. That is in you, and in the Father, and in me, and in everything. And if you get this, if you know this, then you begin to see yourself as connected to this divine intelligence that is everywhere, that is always flowing, that is inexhaustible, that is non-judgmental, that is available for you to plug into, just like electricity. And you can do anything you want with it, like electricity. It'll light up a hospital where everybody is reputed to be ill, and it'll light up a house of ill repute. <laughs> you can do what you want with it. It is there. It is divine. And you are a piece of it. You are connected to it. And once you trust in this, and once you know this, you almost come to a different perspective in your life. Earlier in the first principle, I had talked about these archetypes that uh, Carl Jung referred to. And in these archetypes, he said that we move from athletes to warriors to statesmen to spirit, and then when we are there, we can be all of these things. And one of the things that he also said is that if you don't get to this highest place, this highest archetype, then you will continue to uh, come back and do it. Now, he's talking about reincarnation. And I'm not going to talk about reincarnation here. Um, reincarnation is an interesting subject. It's an exciting subject. I always liked Eleanor Roosevelt's response when they asked her, do you believe in reincarnation? She said, I don't think it would be any more bizarre for me to show up in another lifetime than it was for me to show up in this one. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I'm open, all right? <laughs> I'm talking here about this divine intelligence and making the case that it is everywhere. Consequently, there's no place that it's not. I repeat over and over. Therefore, it's in you and all that you would like to have in your life. So we're really talking about a new alignment here rather than mystical, magical stuff. In order to get what I'm talking about here, you have to understand that there are essentially two theories of nature at work. And I'd like to just share these two theories of nature and have you listen, perhaps with a little bit of objectivity, and remember the cookie thief that I put in the very first tape. The thing that you think you know, and you're absolutely certain that you know something, because you just have this inner conviction that it's true, regardless of where it came from, and then it turns out that you were the cookie thief. These two theories of nature, we have been brought up in, in tribal consciousness, and I'm not here to put down anybody's religious persuasion. This is not a talk about religion. It is a talk about spirituality, higher consciousness, and it is a program about manifesting, not recruiting or putting anybody's religion down. I honor everyone's right to see God and soul and spirit in their own private and personal way. And I celebrate everybody's finding that spiritual loving place within themselves, however they feel it is organized 
under whatever set of rules that they think are appropriate. I honor it all. And I think we need more of it in the world, not less. With that said, I would like to examine these two theories of nature very briefly. The first theory of nature is the one that most of us have been brought up on. And this theory of nature is one that keeps us from becoming a manifester, from being able to do what Jesus Christ said we could do, which is all that he has done and even greater things, that there is a divinity within you. This theory of nature says that essentially the universe is a monarchy and that God is the king and you are the subjects. And the subjects are inferior to the king. You remember the divine right of kings and how democracy was founded by sort of tossing out this idea that kings had a divine right and that they had a special connection to God. And a lot of them, uh, at the time of the French and American revolutions, were thrown out and executed and so on, and uh, democracy sort of tended to take over. Well, this theory of nature says that essentially there is a boss. Very often this boss is a male, almost always, I shouldn't say very often, always this boss is a male, usually a white male with a beard, a white dead male in heaven who controls and judges and is separate from us and we are the subjects of this boss. We are separate from this boss in such a way that we are basically, as people, as individuals, we are not to be trusted. We can't be trusted. There's something, there's a, we are smeared or we are stained, if you will, with sin and untrustworthiness. And that God is what is trusted, but God is outside of us. So we are separate from that. So we're looking for divinity in the boss outside of us. Okay? And most of us have grown up with this idea. This is, even though if you read the work of the great spiritual teachers, they all say the kingdom of heaven is within you, know that you are God, have in you the same mind as Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. These are quotes from St. Paul and from St. John. There's been a sort of a misinterpretation of this, and what we have done is we have subjugated ourselves to this idea of this first theory of nature of the monarchy, if you will, that the boss is outside of us and we are untrustworthy. Now, the problem with this theory of nature that we have adopted is that we can never come to trust in ourselves because we essentially are conceived with an original stain. We are already, there is something wrong with us. If you are untrustworthy to begin with, in your origination, if you cannot trust in yourself, then you can't even trust in your assessment of yourself as untrustworthy. You see, if you say to yourself, hey, I'm really not trustworthy. But you say, well, wait a minute. I can't trust that. Why not? Because I'm not trustworthy to begin with. Do you see that you will always be lost and you will never be able to trust in yourself as long as you start with this supposition that God or spirit or soul or organizing intelligence is something that is out there that I am separate from and that I am inferior to? You're lost. The second theory of nature says that God, or the boss, or whatever, is not outside of us, but is everywhere, and is an energy that is love. And that this love does not judge, but is in all things, and allows us to have a free will. And that this God, if you will, is everywhere, at all times, and is loving and caring. The way I see it is I think of God as like the ocean for me. To understand this idea of learning to trust. God is like the ocean. And I am a glass. And I take this glass and I dip it into the ocean. And I say, okay, what do I have here? And the answer is I have a glass of God. Now, it's not as big 
It's not as strong. It's not as all-knowing. It's not as all-powerful. But it is still God. And just like a wave on the ocean is what the ocean is doing, you are what God is doing. And until you know this, you will never have the trust I'm talking about. You are what God is doing. And if you take a drop of water out of that ocean and you separate it out and you put it over here, you will find that it is weak, that it will collapse, that it has no power, that it can't do anything because it is separated from its source. And the same is true of us. When we separate ourselves from our source, from the divinity that is in all things, we take and make ourselves powerless, impotent, unable to do the divine things that we can do when we are united. Both as united with God, or with soul, or spirit, whatever you want to call it, united with each other. You see, it's that separation. It's always that separation. So it's almost like learning to trust in yourself involves trusting in the fact that you have a divinity. And this divinity is evident on the basis of the idea that God is everywhere. And if this intelligence is everywhere, you have to trust that it's in you. And there's no mistakes here. And while you may not always honor everything that you do and that others do, you can see that your essence, your basic essence of what it is that created you in the first place is that divine organizing intelligence that can never die. You've got to know that. You've got to trust in that. When you trust in this, what you're doing is you're trusting in whatever it is that created you in the very first place. You see, the intellect has trouble with this because the intellect is the mind and the mind is the ego. If you ask most people, where is your center? Where are you centered? They will point to their head. Where do you originate from? Where is your source? Where is your ability to think and to process, they will point to their head and they will say, it's in my brain. My brain is what makes me be able to think and be able to understand concepts and so on. If you ask a spiritual being, where is your source? Where is your center? What is it that gives you the ability to understand these great miraculous things? They will point to their heart. And so heart consciousness is very different than head consciousness. The head consciousness is one which tries to analyze it, so tries to figure it out, and has a great deal of difficulty with it because it's coming from this position of separateness. The heart is your intuition. The heart is the part of you that says, I know and I trust, and it works for me, and I don't have to convince anyone else of it. And once you have this, even prayer becomes not like uh, most people think of prayer as like uh, God is like this huge vending machine in the sky, all right? And I put in my tokens, and I behave in a certain way, and certain things are going to come to me. But there's an authentic kind of prayer that is very different than this. And this kind of prayer is one in which your prayer is in communion with God rather than separation from. When I have trouble, if I'm writing and something doesn't seem to come, if I am struggling with any concept in my life, if I don't feel well, even if I have a little bit of a, a fever or something like that, whenever I feel out of balance, my prayer isn't fix me. My prayer is I am with you. Help me, as the ocean helps that which it particularizes, help me to find within myself the ability to know what to write. I turn it over to this higher part 
but it's not something that I'm ever separate from. That's trust. That kind of trust in combination with knowing that you're no longer afraid of being God. Know ye that ye are God's. And I am in you, and you are in me, and I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. It's like this is something that we are being taught, and yet we have been conditioned almost to subscribe to another idea, which says that I am not trustworthy, I am separate from, I can't do those things. That has to be transcended. You have to understand that in terms of people using it to give fear to you. And our greatest fear is the fear that we're going to be alone, that we're going to be abandoned. But this universal intelligence that is everywhere, this divine intelligence that is universal, that is in all things, how can it abandon us? Wherever we go, it's there. When you trust in that and know it without any doubt, you begin to see it everywhere. You see it in the flowers, you see it in the sunsets. You see it in your babies and in your mother-in-law. You see it in all places. And what you're doing when you see it is you're recognizing that I am worthy and I am important and I am significant. Yes, I am connected to God. I am what God is doing. your divinity with unconditional love. The emphasis is on the un. There are no conditions. That the force that we're speaking about here in this program is the force of love. Another word for God is love. Another word for this divine energy, this universal intelligence is love. Love is the glue that holds everything together. It's the energy within every cell that allows it to stay in place. If you take an electron microscope and you artificially begin to manipulate the electrons inside of an atom and you align a certain number of them, when you reach a certain critical mass number, one-third, one-tenth, whatever that number might be, all of a sudden, all the rest of those electrons within that atom automatically align. They just line up with each other. That force, when you reach a critical mass within an electron, within a subatomic particle, within a molecule, within an atom, within each and every one of us, is this force that Pierre Teilhard de Chardin of Chardin said, is the glue that holds everything together in the universe. And being able to do your manifesting requires this kind of commitment to this. I think the most beautiful passage in the entire New Testament is Corinthians 13. I'd like to share it with you. It's something that I read every day. I use it in my talks most of the time. And it really is reflective of how important this principle is. 
It says these words, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It seemed to me, as I was writing Manifest Your Destiny, and as I was preparing myself for this program, that it would be impossible to not include the necessity of experiencing unconditional love, even if you just did it for a day, in order to be able to understand its relationship to manifesting. You see... The force that is universal, the force that is divine, the force that we call universal intelligence, the God force that is in all things, is love. Which means that you, when you remove yourself from love, remove yourself from the God force, from God, from this divine energy. So that thoughts that you have that take you away from love, thoughts of judgment, remember, it does not judge. It does not keep record of wrongs. It bears no anger, no hatred. This is a very tough thing for those of us who are rooted in the physical domain. <laughs> to begin to practice this idea of living unconditional love in our lives. It requires removing judgment from ourselves. The thing that is the source of most difficulties in most relationships is this statement that if only you were more like me, then we would be getting along a whole lot better right now. See, if what you think about is what expands... And what you're thinking about is what's missing or what's wrong or what you don't like or what is evil or what is bad in another person. Then the relationship has to take that tack, that road, that path. It has to. Because what you think about is what expands. As you think, so shall you be. If you're thinking about what you don't like, then what you don't like is what will expand. So it really requires, if you want to be able to manifest love in your life, or loving relationships in your life, or peace in your life, you have to shift your thoughts to unconditional love. Even when people are behaving in ways toward us that we find offensive. I've often used the metaphor in my talks and some of, even my earlier programs of the orange. If I had an orange up here and I were to take that orange and I were to squeeze that orange as hard as I could squeeze it and ask you what will come out, you would say orange juice. 
And if I said, why, when you squeeze an orange as hard as you can squeeze it, does orange juice come out? You'd say, well, it's an orange. That's what's inside. And if I said, well, does it matter who squeezes it? Or what instrument you use? Or what time of day? Or what the conditions are? You'd say, that's all irrelevant. None of that makes any difference. What the circumstances are, what time of day it is, who does it? When you squeeze an orange, you get what's inside. Orange juice. And now if you extend that metaphor to yourself and someone squeezes you, someone puts pressure on you, someone says something about you that you find offensive, and out of you comes anger and hatred and bitterness and tension and fear and anxiety and stress and an absence of what you'd like to manifest because you can't manifest with those things. They are blockages to the flow of divine love and the universal God force. It isn't because of who did the squeezing. It isn't because of who said what they said. It isn't because of the instruments that they use or the timing. It's because that's what's inside. So how does it get inside? How does orange juice get inside an orange? I don't know. It's one of those great mysteries like the plum. <laughs> it's just, I, you give God the credit, you enjoy the oranges, and, uh, and you move along. But how anger and hatred and tension and bitterness and fear and anxiety and stress and an absence of what you want to manifest shows up in your life is because of how you choose to process the world and how you choose to make the pictures in your mind, the visualizations, the images in your mind, which literally are what cooperates with this divine energy, with this divine force. So your pictures your inner pictures of what you want to manifest, if they are tainted by anything other than unconditional love, as it shows up, you inhibit that manifestation process. You stop it cold. You can prophecy, you can have knowledge, you can do all of, have all of these great things, and as it says in Corinthians, it will perish. If you have knowledge, it will be stilled. If you have prophecies, they will go away. What it's saying there is, you have a body, and that body will disappear. And all that you know and experience in the physical domain will also disappear. But love never does, because love and God, love and divine essence are exactly the same, and they are unconditional. You have to have the same love for God or for this divine essence that it has always had for you. Through the worst of your days, through the lowest points in your life, this love has always been there. It's available to you. You could take it at any time. It's never, you're never turned away. And it's a supply that's inexhaustible. You can't exhaust it. You can't make it go away. It is there. So, there is a power in unconditional love that is very difficult for most of us to grasp. I don't know if you've ever been around a being who lives and experiences unconditional love, but when you are, you discover that the energy that they radiate is infectious, like being in a room with Mother Teresa, just being in her presence. They said of Jesus, they said of Buddha, that when they would go into a village, just their presence in the village... Nothing more, just their presence in the village would change the consciousness of those around them. From the perspective of having this divinity within you, which is a love for what is going to manifest, what happens when you start picturing your world this way is that your life starts to change. What changes is you feel more peaceful. Love and peace, unconditional love and peace, really go hand in hand. And when you get this quality, and what I suggest to you here is that in order to practice this, to understand that you sleep better, you eat better, you automatically begin to take better care of your body. Toxins are no longer that important to you. Exercise becomes something that you just absolutely do because you're treating your body with unconditional love. And it demands that, it encourages that, it wants that. It doesn't want to be dreary. It doesn't want to be overweight. It doesn't want to be drugged up. It doesn't want to be lethargic. It wants to be flowing because the universal energy that makes the whole thing work flows. It doesn't stop. That energy isn't stopping. It's not stagnant. It's a flowing. When you start doing these things and these changes start taking place, what happens is also the prosperity that you thought 
you couldn't have also begins to flow. You've stopped all blockages. And while this just sounds like, oh yeah, but I don't, I, I don't have to do anything, you will do something. You will act upon this unconditional love. It's like go on a program for three days. Make a three-day program in which you are going to communicate with your spouse, your lover, one of your children, a friend, a co-worker, a boss, someone that you are close to. And every thought that you are going to have directed at that person is going to be one of unconditional love. No matter how crappy they may act, no matter how much complaining they may do, no matter how much you find them to be irritating or whatever, you are going to respond with unconditional love. Not gushy, oh, isn't that great, you're throwing up on me again. Not, <laughs> not, not that at all. But just the thought, the absence of judgment, the absence of anger, the absence of the ego demand that says, you know, you should really be like I am. You're wrong and I'm right. You just let go of that. Try it for three days. A three-day program of unconditional love. And watch what happens to your energy level. And watch what happens to the things that you want to manifest in your life. And begin to notice how you're sleeping and what the content of your dreams are. And notice how other people begin to treat you. You see, unconditional love is joy and it's also power. There's an enormous power, but it's not the power that is an investment in having power over others. It's a power of being able to tune in finally to the thing that makes the whole universe work. What do you think keeps this whole planet from falling off into an abyss? What do you think it is that keeps your, your uh, shoulder uh, from falling off? <laughs> what do you think it is that keeps the cells of your eyeballs in their sockets? There's a force, there's an energy, there's something that is working that keeps everything in place, that makes it all work, that makes it all flow you finally begin to tune into that. You start to trust your nature more than you trust your intellect, which is your ego. Your nature knows how to work. It knows how to make your body work. Your nature knows exactly how many nutrients to send to all the different organs of the body. You don't have to think about that every time you eat something. It's working. Your nature knows how much oxygen to take in and how much to let out. You don't need a formula for that. Your intellect says, that water there it can't possibly be made up of two parts of hydrogen and one part of oxygen. Those are gases. Your intellect says, there's no way. But nevertheless, it is, isn't it, as we examine it. So your nature works perfectly in perfect harmony as does everything else that keeps the oceans from tilting on their side and, and having tidal waves. This nature of yours that you are in, that is in you, that you are not separate from, is flowing. It's perfect. It's unconditional. It doesn't judge. It doesn't ask anything. It just flows. It's everything that I read there in Corinthians 13. Be that and the rest of this will fall right into place. It's astounding how powerful this unconditional love is. I want to tell you a story as you think about this force and picturing and putting yourself in a perspective of unconditional love, which is an absence of judgment, an absence of anger, an absence of telling yourself that someone ought to be like you. And I want to tell you how it has worked for me. One of the things I have known in my life in recent years is that it's important for me to get my ego out of what I do and how to go about doing that, which is to take my attention off of the outcome and what's in it for me and how much I'm going to get and put it more on serving and stop being so concerned with uh, how much comes to me and how much approval I get and how much money I get and all of the things like that and to just stay more centered on what it is I'm about. And I picked up a story last uh, Christmas morning, a newspaper. And my daughter Tracy and my wife Marceline were, were there, and uh, I read this story, and the story said, woman spends her 27th year in a coma. And I read this story, and it was a story of a woman named Kay O'Bara and her daughter, Edwarda O'Bara. 
The story went on to say that uh, in 1970, on January the 3rd, this young girl who was 16 years of age slipped into a diabetic coma at uh, about 4 o'clock in the morning. She had been given oral insulin as an adolescent and uh, called diabetes, and it wasn't uh, metabolizing with her, and uh, she wasn't getting the insulin. It wasn't going into her bloodstream. And she woke up, and uh, she was just shaking and uh, in great, great pain, and they rushed her to the hospital. And as she was on the hospital bed, her mother went there with her in 1970. Eduarda, the young girl, who was a senior in high school at the time, said to her mom, Mom, you won't leave me, will you, Mommy? And she had never called her mommy before. She had always called her mom or mother. And Kay said to her, I will never leave you, I promise. And a promise is a promise. And that was in 1970. Well, 27 years later, Kay has been feeding Eduarda every two hours for 27 years. Imagine yourself never being able to sleep in a bed for 27 years, at 2 a.m., 4 a.m., 6 a.m., 8 a.m., getting up every night, sleeping in a chair next to your daughter. Imagine yourself never going to a mall or going to a movie. And imagine yourself being drained financially by medical bills alone that number now $3,000 a month just for the medication with an income of $1,100 a month. And imagine yourself also every four hours, 24 hours a day, six times a day, having to take a blood sugar reading and then administer insulin based upon the reading six times every day. And imagine yourself coming home from that hospital bed. This woman was a school teacher, a mathematics teacher and physics teacher down in Miami. And she came home four months after the uh, onslaught of the coma because they no longer could afford to stay in the hospital. Their insurance had run out long ago. They were now borrowing money. And then imagine four years later, the husband having a conversation with you, saying, I can no longer stand to see myself standing by, watching while our finances are drained, and I can't do anything for my daughter. I'm going to go to heaven and work from there and the next day dying of a massive heart attack at the age of 49. And then when that happened, the other daughter, Eduardo's sister, becoming a crack cocaine addict and living on the street and having her only little baby being raised by a K as well. Losing your husband, your daughter to a coma, your other daughter to the streets, and still every two hours, 24 hours a day, 27 years feeding and taking care of this child. This is the story of Kay O'Bara. And I read that story and I was astounded by this kind of unconditional love. And I said to Tracy over and over again, I said, I just, I just can't fathom how somebody could take a quarter of a century and more and have this kind of devotion. And I took a copy of one of the books I wrote a couple of years back called Real Magic, which is a book about miracles. And I wrote in that book, You Are My Hero. And I sent Kay a check. I thought that I was then done with it, which is, it was a very touching story, but it was still sort of tugged at my heartstrings. And I went away in January to write this Manifest Your Destiny book. And while I was there, I turned on the TV for the only time I had it on while I was there one evening after I had completed writing about unconditional love this principle that I'm sharing with you here. And on the TV, there was a show called Inside Edition, and Deborah Norville was the hostess, and she came on and said, and I know Deborah, I've been on the air with her, and I admired her a great deal, and she said, there's going to be someone on the show that's very special later, a mother whose daughter's been in a coma for almost 27 years. You'll want to stay tuned. And I thought, wow, that could only be the lady, because I didn't even remember her name that I had written to back at Christmas. And sure enough, they open up the TV show with her reading to Eduarda from Real Magic that I had sent to her. And I thought, something is happening here. Something is happening here. And I thought, when I get home, I am going to look up that woman and find out if I can get her phone number and maybe call her and see if there's anything more that I can do because I was so touched by that. And when I got home in February, um, after writing... 
picked up the, uh, my mail, and I had a huge stack of mail, and on the top of the mail stack was a letter from Kay O'Bara thanking me for the check I had sent and for the book and asking me if I would please come down. Well, my wife and I went down to see Kay and Eduarda. And when we went to Kay's house down in Miami, about 40 miles from our home, walked into Eduarda's room, a room filled with angels and relics and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, spiritual uh, literature and uh, music and... Uh, just, it was like we knew we were in a holy place. And as I talked to Kay and told her how, how touched I was by her unconditional love, her display of unconditional love, I had to fly away a couple of days later and go out to the West Coast, California, out into California. I had to do a show out there, a politically incorrect show. And I did the show, and when I was coming back after doing the show, my wife called and she said, uh, you know, Oprah Winfrey is going to be taping uh, a show on people in comas. And they would like you to be at her home tomorrow, if that's possible. And I said, well, I'm not flying back till tomorrow. She said, well, maybe you could fly on the all-nighter, the red-eye, and get in in the morning. And I said, all right, I'll do it. And I flew home, and I went there, and they taped during the day. They came to her home. And while I was there, I talked a little bit about... Uh, who I believed this person to be, who was doing her holy work from this place. And then the show aired. And the show was about people in comas, but it was focused on this policeman in Tennessee who had been in a coma for nine years. And then he suddenly awoke, and he just start, began talking after nine years, and it was considered to be a miracle. And they had his brother and some other people on the show. And then they had some other people who had been in a coma but uh, had come back, but they weren't the same as they were before the coma. And the focus of the show was mostly on how tough it was, what a struggle this was, and it's not easy on the rest of the family, and so on. And then Kay came on the show. And Kay is the most uplifting and uh, dynamic and positive and joyful person. And she said, this is not a chore. This is an honor. And when she was asked, well, why do you do this? She said, well, God asked me to do it. And God never gives you any more than you can handle. She said, I only asked for two daughters. I didn't ask for them to be anything special, anything unique. I just asked for two daughters. And I take care of her, and I am honored to serve her in this way. And she is fed through a tube. She has brain activity. She was 27 years ago in what is called a stage one coma, which is one in which they had to tape her eyes shut because her coma was so deep. And today more than a quarter of a century later, when I had my other children come down and sing to her, and Serena sat up there on the bed with her and held her hand, this was Easter Sunday, and I said, we have to go now, Grandma's coming over, and we have to get home now. And she turned her head, and a tear came down her eye. And the last time that I was in her presence, which was not more than a few days ago, when I walked in, after having been gone during the summer, she smiled in recognition. She's in what is now called a stage nine coma. Whether she's coming out or not, we don't know. But five years ago, Kay told me what happened in confidence. She said, it was 1991, and it was in October, and I woke up to give her four o'clock feeding, because she only sleeps for 45 minutes at a time in a chair. And she said there was a bright light in the room. And I thought someone was there to harm Eduarda because people have driven by her home and shot bullet holes into their walls saying, we're going to put her out of her misery. There's that kind of consciousness that is out there. And one interviewer said, isn't your daughter a vegetable? And she said, I've never seen a vegetable smile, have you? So she saw this light back in the room when she was preparing the food to go into the tube that feeds her. And she walked back there very quickly and there... Standing at the foot of the bed was an apparition whom she later identified as the Blessed Mother, Virgin Mary. And she began to talk after her initial fear and said, was told that your daughter is a blessed one. And she said, well, why is she in a coma? And Kay told me that the Blessed Mother had told her that your daughter is a victim soul and you'll have to find out what that means yourself so you'll know. 
And she called the different priests and the different places in the Catholic Church hierarchy. And none of them had ever heard of that. And then she called the cardinal. And the cardinal said, where did you hear this term? And she said, well, I'd really rather not say, because she didn't want to be perceived as being nutsy and crazy and so on, talking to ghosts. And the cardinal said, well, this is a term that goes back to antiquity. And a victim soul is someone who deliberately takes on suffering as their purpose in being here in order to teach compassion or to teach love or to teach peace. Very much like Gandhi did during the rioting in the 30s and 40s when he would fast to the point of dying as long as there was some violence. And he was willing to take that on rather than to allow that to continue. And we all know, of course, of the great tradition of Christianity, of taking on suffering so that the rest of us might be freer people. And when I interviewed Kay about Edwarda, I asked her what was Edwarda like, and I asked her classmates, and I asked her sister and her relatives, and everyone that I asked said the same thing, that Edwarda was like a saint when she was a little girl. If she saw someone who was hungry, she would give them her allowance. If she saw someone who was cold, she would take her sweater off and give it to them. She studied the saints, carried books about the saints with her wherever she went. She didn't know how to judge anyone. And I went home, and I was doing my meditation, and I thought, what can I do? What is the message here? Why am I so attracted to this? And in my meditation, I said, uh, I'm going to write her story, and I'm not going to take any money for it. Just like I appeared on Oprah with her for the first time when there was nothing in it for Wayne Dyer. And even though I was only on a minute or so of that show, it was one of the most fulfilling things I'd ever done. Because I knew it wasn't for my own ego, but in the name of serving. And I called Kay and I said, I would like to write your story. And I'll donate all the royalties to you, to the Eduardo Obera Fund. And we'll sell a million of these. And we'll get you out of debt, because she has this onus of debt around her neck. Three hundred and some thousand dollars worth. What she has done is had made baked goods, and has done uh, cookbooks, and has done celebrity auctions, and has borrowed from here, has had 35 to 37 different credit cards going at one time, and having to borrow from loan sharks and being threatened, all just to keep this thing going, because there's been no other way to make it work. And her debts are huge. I said, I, can, I know I can remove that. And she said, you know, Doc, it's funny that you call because the Blessed Mother said that the right angel would show up and would tell the story with dignity the way it needs to be told. I said, well, the only th- thing I can say, Kay, is that I have to tell the whole story. Your fear of what others might think when I talk about your speaking to apparitions and so on has to be dissipated. She said, I trust you completely. Tell it as you will. And this is the result. It's called A Promise is a Promise. An almost unbelievable story of a mother's unconditional love and what it can teach us. And I asked my wife, my dear wife, who um, has birthed seven children, to write a mother's perspective. And she wrote a beautiful chapter in here. And we also included photographs of Kay and Eduardo before the coma and after. And in my heart, I believe this is unconditional love in action. Very much like Mother Teresa sees Jesus Christ in all of his distressing disguises, I believe that Kay's work with Eduarda teaches us about a full measure of unconditional love. And that Eduarda made the choice, as the Blessed Mother told her. When Kay said, well, did she have a choice to do this? And she said, absolutely. And she's teaching compassion. And as I speak about it here, and as I speak about it on these tapes, and people listen to it, and people go out and purchase this book, and the money goes to Kay and Eduarda, I believe that what is happening is that she is teaching us compassion, which is the cornerstone of unconditional love. And she's doing her work through me, through you who are listening, for those of you who purchase A Promise is a Promise, and give it away as gifts to others who have demonstrated unconditional love. As Kay says, 
It's not if she will wake up, but when there's enough compassion in the world, her work will be completed, and she will either awaken or God will take her with him. And that's unconditional love. There's no better example of it than I know. Thank you very much. I am deeply thankful for all that I have received and I enjoy giving to others in the spirit of love and service. This is a very important part, not only of uh, being able to have show up in your life what it is that is the fulfillment of your heart's desire, but it is also a beautiful way to begin living your life every day. There's an old saying that says, if you're not generous when it's hard, you will not be generous when it's easy. And generosity isn't necessarily the um, giving away of what you have, but it's more of an attitude of spirit, as is gratitude. So there are really three components to this eighth principle. The first is gratitude, the second is generosity, and the third is service. Let me take them one at a time here. The first is gratitude and I remember reading a book a few years back by a friend of mine. His name is Dan Millman. I believe Dan has a program with Nightingale Conner. He's a wonderful speaker. And he wrote a book called uh, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. And in The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, he had this character who was uh, an enlightened kind of being. And in uh, Dan's uh, book, The uh, Way of the Peaceful Warrior, this character's name was Socrates. And Socrates was uh, this fellow who worked in a gas station, but he could do all of these bizarre kinds of things. He could uh, jump up onto a uh, roof 14 feet in the air by just transporting himself. And he had uh, this ability to uh, make himself disappear and to change his shape and do many of the things that most of us, because most of us are cookie thieves, believe somehow that we can't do these things and we know a truth and we are attached to that truth that this is the only dimension there is and there are no other dimensions that I can get involved in or peer into because my senses have told me this and we've come to put an extraordinary amount of faith in these senses which mislead us all the time about reality. So um, Socrates was one of these people who was living in a different dimension, a different level of consciousness. So Socrates tells his student to go out onto a rock and sit until he can think of something important and come back and tell him something important or something significant, I believe it was. And he uh, goes out there, the student goes out there, Dan, he's telling his own story, and he sits there on a rock and he sits there, and every time he thinks he's got something that's really important, then he thinks about telling Socrates this, he realizes how unimportant this is. <laughs> so after sitting there for a long period of time, and finally, after going to Socrates and telling him things, and Socrates says, no, that's not important. Back he would go to his rock. <laughs> and he did this two or three times. No, that's not, that's not significant. And he'd go back to his rock. So finally he came and he said something, and Socrates said to him, you've got it you have discovered something significant. And that something significant was, he said to him, there are no ordinary moments. There are no ordinary moments. And Socrates said, yes, that's significant. That is a great teaching, a great learning. And that's really the essence of gratitude. The essence of gratitude is um, understanding that every moment of your life is something to be grateful for, and that everything that shows up in your life 
is something that you will want to be expressing a sense of gratitude about. I speak often about how we take things for granted, and taking things for granted is one of the obstacles to having an attitude of gratitude. Taking things for granted very often, I mean, I've often said that I think we should have special days every year in which we appreciate all the different aspects of our being. You know, like we give thanks for our liver on Mondays, <laughs> you know, on the 3rd of January, Liver Appreciation Day. You know, or just try to imagine what it would be like if you didn't have that liver. There would be nothing for you to imagine. And then, you know, for the air that we breathe and for the ground that we walk upon, and for gravity, and for the food that we have, and for the sky, and for, you know, our eyelids, uh, which we just take for granted. Without them, how difficult it would be for us to get through even an hour of our day. And our toenails, and, uh, and everything about ourselves. To begin to experience a sense of gratitude. Now, when we're talking about affirmations, and we're talking about manifestation, here we want to look at what it is we are asking to have manifested for ourselves. And remember, we are not creating anything. We're just redistributing, if you will. Everything that needs to be created is already in the universe. There's no place to go. I remember when uh, there was, the story was told of, uh, of Swami Muktananda, great spiritual teacher who was dying. And all of his devotees and students gathered around, and he was leaving. And he had announced that. His students were praying with him, and they were pleading with him, please don't go, please don't go, Swami. Please, we're not ready for you to leave. And he opened his eye and looked at them and said, don't be silly. Where could I go? Where is there to go? Everything is already here. And so... When you are manifesting and you are asking for things to show up in your life, as they begin to show up in your life, learning to be grateful for this. Now, that's not so difficult. Most of us say thank you. I have a little ritual that I do every day, and that is uh, almost every day God sends money to me in some form, particularly when I'm running. It happens virtually every day of my life. And it's a little game, a mental game that I have played with myself. I'll be out running, and I'll be thinking about all of the abundance that has shown up in my life, and how grateful I am, and, and how grateful I am to have my children. One of the things that my wife and I practice regularly is telling our children how fortunate we feel to be their parents. How lucky we are. Not how lucky they are to have us as parents, <laughs> But how, how blessed and how grateful we are. And I'll often pick up my little boy or one of my little girls and just put my arms around and say, You know, <laughs> I am really lucky to have you. you know, I'm really blessed to have you show up in my life. I feel that way about all my children. And my little ritual that I play every day when I'm out running is uh, little coins that I find in the street. I found one this morning when I was running before I made this presentation. Right out in front of the, uh, of the hotel. A penny, a shiny penny. And you know, I have a... Uh, <laughs> I've never admitted this in public before. <laughs> but I have a large jar of coins that is hidden behind, in, in a bookcase, behind um, a whole... Nobody knows where this is except myself. And this contains all of the money that I have found in the last 20 years. And it's a huge amount of money. Some of it is wrinkled up bills. A lot of it is foreign money because I've run in foreign countries. And most of the coins are dirty and uh, they've been out in the street for a long time. And uh, there's a couple of $20 bills. There's a $100 bill in there. And every time I look at that, that little symbol that just keeps growing, it reminds me to be grateful. And when I pick up one of those coins, I always say, thank you, God, for this symbol of abundance that has shown up in my life. Thank you. And I put it in my pocket and I put it away in a special way. And when I get back to my office, I go to that little place and I put it in there and I look at that and that's my reminder. What gratitude does is it keeps you connected to that source which brings things into your life. It keeps that connection open because gratitude comes from love. See, there's 
two ways to look at things in your life. There's to appreciate what shows up in your life or to depreciate what shows up in your life. And to depreciate it means to complain about it, to whine about it, to, to uh, resent it because it's not big enough, it's not shiny enough, it's not what I wanted. That's a depreciation. And appreciation, to appreciate, means to have a sense of being grateful for it. Gratitude, there's a wonderful definition that uh, I use for uh, gratitude. Gratitude is the complete and full response of the heart to everything in the universe. The complete and full response of the heart to everything in the universe. And this gratitude disallows feelings of separateness from what shows up. See, resentment or complaining or fault-finding are things that block you, are obstacles to that free flow. They reinforce the idea that I am separate from that and it's not giving me enough. Gratitude for what shows up and expressing that gratitude with affirmations and regular affirmations of it is um, a way of keeping that channel clear between you and that divine presence. And doing this, this little ritual that I do with the coins, I also do it when I'm uh, driving and someone lets me in, into a lane when I'm trying to change lanes. And there's this very quick and silent little thank you for that loving gesture. It doesn't seem like much. It's not like this big deal. I don't tell anybody about it. I happen to be talking about it now because it's just the focus of this particular principle. But it's not anything... Uh, that I share with anybody else. It's a very private little thing that I do. When someone lets me into a parking space, a, a thank you, an acknowledgement. You know, when, when I'm in a grocery store and I go out to the car and I take the cart out to the parking lot and I put my groceries in the, in the trunk, I always take the, tr the uh, thing and I take it back. It doesn't seem like uh, this, it's my own little private little thing. It's like I'm grateful for this food. When we go into a restaurant, and we sit down and eat, and there's um, a sign there that says generally, thank you for taking your tray and, uh, and putting it back. And for My children have all learned that when we finish up where we're eating, we are thankful for the food, and we're also thankful for the place that we have to eat, and we, we want to leave it the way it was when we got here. We're grateful for the cleanliness. We're grateful for the air. There's this kind of attitude. I remember being with um, Wally Amos, famous Amos, in uh, Hawaii, who also has a program with Nightingale Conant. Everybody seems to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first time I'd ever met him, we were walking on a street in, uh, in Maui, and he saw a, a beer can there, and he said, excuse me, and he walked all the way over there, and he picked up the beer can, and he put it into the uh, trash can. And he didn't say a word to me, and I didn't say a word to him, but I noticed that. I noticed there was a, a sense of, of gratitude for the islands. It's what I call an aloha kind of spirit a sense of feeling grateful and expressing it in everything that you do in your life. And this kind of an attitude begins to become infectious. And it also opens the channel for more to show up. People who are grateful seem to get more than people who are resentful. You know why? Because people who are resentful don't understand that their resentment itself is what's blocking and when they do get something, their instantaneous response to it is, it's not enough. It's not big enough. Somebody else got something that's better. I should have had this. I wanted it yesterday. It showed up too late. It's not the right color. It's not the right size. You know, the endless not feeling of gratitude. There's a wonderful little old joke about a lady who was on the beach with her grandson. And she's walking along the beach. And all of a sudden, this huge wave comes along and picks up the little boy and he disappears. And she just goes down on her knees and she just doesn't know what to do. This is my grandson. Please, God, send my grandson back. I can't stand. Uh, what has happened? How could this have happened? Oh, please, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. Just... And all of a sudden, another wave comes along and plops him right back down, right in front of her. And she looks at him and she turns around and she goes on her knees. She says to God, uh, he was wearing a hat. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> I haven't thought of that story in a long time. <laughs> this idea is not just good citizenship we're talking about here. 
It's cultivating this attitude of flow, of allowing, of permitting things to continue to grow in you because gratitude is love. Now, the hardest part about gratitude for most people is the understanding that um, you have to also be grateful when things don't show up. And you have to learn, this is the toughest part, you have to learn to be grateful for that which you don't have and for the suffering that you are going through, and for the experiences of scarcity that seem to be present in your life. Because in essence, until you can be grateful in these moments and understand that you can't have sobriety, generally speaking, without having known its opposite. Everything in the physical plane has its opposite. People who have been through addictions generally know and appreciate and are grateful for those addictions when they transcend them. You won't find very many alcoholics who are in recovery who will say, I resent my addiction days. Instead, what they say is, they were the greatest teachers I ever had. And I couldn't be where I am today without having had those. Now, this is true for all of our experiences. I, when people say to me, are you really, can you really say that you are grateful that your father walked out of your life when you were just a baby? Can you really say that he, the time that he spent in prison and the time, the, the, the fact that he never sent any money and the fact that you had to spend early years in, uh, in foster homes and so on and away from the rest of your family, can you really say that you're grateful for that? I say, my father was my greatest teacher. I never met the man. But without my experience of learning to rely upon myself as a young boy, I couldn't, as a grown man, be teaching self-reliance today. Couldn't do it. Because to learn to rely upon yourself is something that you have to have the direct conscious experience of. And when you've had it, then you can teach it. And I'm grateful for it. I was having dinner last night with my oldest daughter, Tracy, and I was thinking about her mother and I, uh, who have been divorced for 20, 25 years now. And I was telling Tracy at dinner that um, your mother, even though we didn't agree and didn't get along, your mother was one of the great people in my life. There are many qualities that both of us could look at in her, and she can look at in me, certainly, and say, these are the reasons why it didn't work. But you can also do the opposite. You can look at this person and say, but look at these qualities. Look at the honesty. Look at the integrity. Look at these things and remember that. And my experience being married to my daughter's mother, to Judy, those many years ago, when I was a young boy, it seems like, taught me how to be not only a better husband later on and a better father, but it gave me direct experiences of being able to transcend my own pettiness and my own inability to relate at a level that I am able to do today. Without that, I couldn't be where I am today. I've often said to people, I am what is called a reverse paranoid. You know, what is, when, when you ask someone, what is a paranoid? Well, a paranoid thinks that everybody is talking about you and that they're saying terrible things about you. And a reverse paranoid is someone who knows that everybody's talking about you, but they're saying nice things about you. <laughs> <laughs> so when you walk by and someone said, are they talking about me? You say, yeah, of course. Why wouldn't they be? <laughs> and this attitude of being able to be grateful, not just for the things that are manifesting and showing up in your life, but for the things that don't show up and for those experiences, when you get to a point where in this moment I can now say, okay, it didn't show up and there's a great lesson in this and I'll get that lesson and then I'll stop the blockage of abundance flowing into my life. That's what gratitude is. It is the free expression of the heart to the fullness of the universe. And an understanding that you're not going to get it all, that you are it all already. 
You are it all already. That divine, organizing, omniscient, all-loving, unconditional loving God is in you already. And everything that you need to be peaceful, to have love, to be successful, you already have in this moment. You don't need one thing more. Anything else that shows up is just a bonus from the universe. And you ought to be grateful for all of it, including that which doesn't. In order to be able to move to the next level, generally speaking, you first experience a fall. In order to be able to move to the next level, spiritual advancements are usually preceded by a fall of one kind or another. And in order to generate the energy to get to a higher place, you must first experience a fall. It's like when I was a high jumper on the track team. I would run up to the bar, and I would get down as low as I could get, and then I would, by the process of getting down low, I could propel myself to a higher level. That's the metaphor. And you have to be grateful for those falls. The second aspect of this principle is one of generosity. Generosity is taking all that manifests for you in your life, all that shows up for you, and being willing to share it. The thing that generosity does for us is that it liberates us from the concept of scarcity. And that's what we need to have in order to be manifestors. You become liberated from the idea of scarcity when you are willing to generously give of that which shows up in your life. There are many people who tithe. Well, that is, they give a percentage generally 10% of their earnings, to those who provide spiritual nourishment or spiritual food in their life, even when they don't have it. I did a benefit just recently on Maui for a man who, um, when he was 32 or 33 years old, his name is Michael LaBeouf, he um, was a strapping, surfing-type dude, on uh, Maui, just a cool guy who was waiting tables and good-looking and had women coming here and there all the time and just like one of these guys, you know, that you see all over Maui. He was uh, at the beach one day and uh, they were playing uh, frisbee out there and someone threw the frisbee and he said, I'll get it for you. And he went and he dove into the shallow water to get the frisbee. But at the moment that he dove, the wave, somehow it receded at that exact second. And the wave was gone, and he, he hit the sand. Now, this was an experienced surfer. And he broke, the, uh, broke his neck, and he became a quadriplegic in that instant. And then he said, at that moment, he said, I was reborn. That was about three years earlier from now. And this summer, when I was on Maui, a friend of his, Frank Levinson, called me and asked me if I would be willing to do a benefit uh, if I would speak, uh, and if Jerry Jampolsky, who has also done a program with Manuel Conner, <laughs> <laughs> called Love is Letting Go of Fear, and Jerry and I both did a benefit. I spoke for an hour and a half, Jerry spoke for an hour and a half, and people came in and donated money, and he needed $10,000 in order to go to uh, the Miami Project for the uh, treatment of uh, spinal cord injuries. And now they're finding that there are ways to, uh, to not only... Uh, assist these people in their life, but perhaps to even get them walking again. And so they're going to do a complete evaluation, but he needed $10,000. So we did this benefit. And they raised 9000 and I threw in 1000 and he had his 10000 But the interesting thing about this was that when it was done, he took the $1,000 that I gave him, which represented 10% of what he had earned. This man in a wheelchair who is paralyzed from the shoulders down. And he sent it to Kay O'Bara, the woman whose daughter has been in a coma for 27 years, because he felt that he had to give something back. That kind of generosity will allow Michael not only to have the Miami Project show up, where he will be in November, but it will allow probably the healing that he is looking for to begin to take hold because it releases him 
from this idea that there is scarcity out there. If you're free enough to give what you have away, especially the things that you have that you treasure. Like a lot of people say, and I've been practicing this for quite a few years now, a lot of people say, well, you go through your clothes that you haven't worn in the last year or two. And if you haven't worn them, just take them out of the closet and give them to someone who can benefit from them. You can always find someone that will benefit from them, which is a wonderful thing to do. But a more powerful, spiritually enriching thing to do is to go through the clothes that you like the best and that you wear all the time or that you wouldn't want to part with because they really mean so much to you and give 10% of those away. Then you'll see the spiritual food, if you will, beginning to show up more and more into your life when you can give away something of yourself that you seem to be attached to, because detaching from it is a big part of this business of manifesting. You see, when you become generous, you are really saying to the universe and to yourself, very quietly, I know there are no limits to this divine intelligence. I know it's inexhaustible. I know it was never born. I know it can never die. And therefore... I am willing to allow it to flow through me. The divine intelligence is always moving. It is always flowing. Generosity takes you away from that idea that somehow there's a scarcity out there. I remember I was in New Orleans not too long ago, and I was giving a talk, and I went for a walk with uh, my assistant and several other people, several friends who had uh, come there to hear me speak, and we were walking in the seedy section of New Orleans, where there's a lot of uh, a lot of drug addicts, a lot of street people, a lot of uh, prostitutes, a lot of poverty, a lot of lost souls, people who uh, believe that they're alone. And whenever I'm in one of those places, and I seem to be attracted to those places, I think about there but for the grace of God, so many of us know, go I. So many people, when they see homeless people, they think about, well, I'd really like to give to them, but they're really just lazy. And they should go out and get a job. And that keeps me from being generous to them. And I would say to you that if you can't give with love, don't give. Just give a silent blessing. But don't send anger and hatred and judgment and bitterness towards those who are out there whatever it is that they're doing. I wouldn't say give, despite, if you don't feel it coming from your heart, if it's not a heart space thing, then it is artificial and you will just be filled with resentment and you'll stop the blockage of, uh, of this flow of energy. So give a silent blessing to that person and hope that perhaps they can find another way or a higher way. But there's also the element of how often that kind of an attitude is what we use to keep us from being able to part with something that we are so attached to. And it's a very convenient thing to hang on to. And we often forget. And being in New Orleans, and there was a, a young girl, she couldn't have been more than uh, 15. She had been on the streets for four years. She hadn't had a bath, I don't think, in all that time. She um, was obviously into drugs and smelled bad and... Uh, I saw the, uh, the spirit in that child, and I started talking to her, and she was giving me the talk that you hear from street people about all the reasons why she was there, and blaming her mother, and blaming all of these kinds of, uh, and essentially uh, not taking responsibility for what her life was. She was kind of, uh, she started to cry after a little while, and uh, I mean, she was really a little girl. And my heart tugged so strong at her, and I, I offered, I said, you know, my assistant, uh, Maya, was there, and I said, you know, Maya could take you over to the hotel, we can get you a room there, we'll get you all cleaned up. Well, and she just didn't want any part of that at all. So before we left, I said, uh, come over here, Carolyn, and I reached into my pocket, and I had a $100 bill in my pocket, and I gave her the $100 bill. And the people that were there with me said, uh, as we were walking away, <laughs> Don't you realize that you just enabled her to have more drugs? 
and that she's going to spend that on, on alcohol and on. And I said, you know, it doesn't matter to me what she does with the money. That's not why I gave it to her. I said, the money, as far as I'm concerned, represents one act of kindness from one human being to another. That's all it is. I'm detached from the outcome. I'm not concerned about where that will go. But maybe this person just needs to have one person put their arm around her, demonstrate a little caring, and maybe that one act will help her to get her life off of the streets and off of that death sentence that she was living out. Perhaps. And as you practice generosity, practice generosity of spirit, Detached from the outcome about what people are going to do with it, where it's going to go, how it's going to get used, whether it's going to be done for the right way or the way I think it should be done. Detached from that and give from your heart all that shows up in your life. Just let it keep flowing. And after a while, what happens is you are completely detached from how it works out. And you're not even attached to how things show up in your life. And all of those things that you used to be so concerned with when you were back there as an athlete and a warrior and asking for so much and being so concerned of whether you're going to get it and how it's going to show up, when you reach this level of generosity and gratitude in your life, what happens is miraculous. It no longer matters. And the irony here is that as it no longer matters to you, more and more shows up. Until it gets to a point where you can't even handle it all. And you just keep letting it circulate. And you're not concerned at all with where the next one is going to be. You have a knowing. You are so aware of the abundance and the unlimitedness of the divine intelligence that is in everything. That it can't be exhausted that you're willing to allow it to continue to flow through your life. And then you get in synchronicity with that divine force. It's almost like you have a collaboration with fate. And as you collaborate, rather than fight, scarcity moves away in your life. That's how I give. When I give, I ask not for one explanation of how it's going to be used. The giving is done for the purpose of being generous, of the opening of the heart chakra to another human being. And the final aspect of this is one that is called service. And very simply, it is shifting the emphasis of your life off of what are my quotas and what's in it for me onto how may I serve you. I have had to practice this in my own life and it has worked in ways that I can't even begin to tell you. When I go before an audience and I sit down to meditate, I repeat the mantra, how may I serve, how may I serve, how may I serve? How can I get my ego out of this presentation, out of this program, out of what it is that I am doing and my needs to have rewards and have money come into me and my needs to have applause and to have people tell me how wonderful I am. How can I get all of that out? And it doesn't matter what you do. You can shift to gratitude, generosity, and service. If you're, if you're a dentist, you can give a flower to every patient. You can call them in the evening and ask how they're doing, as my dentist always does. You can make your uh, waiting room a place where people look forward to coming by putting in programs like this for people to listen to while they're being drilled on. (laughs) It doesn't make any difference. If you're a cab driver, you can make your cab a place of service. You can do a little bit extra. And the irony is when you turn your life over to being a statesman, and ultimately to being a spiritual being, this attitude allows this free-flowing, unconditional loving energy 
that is the divine universe, that is God, to enter into your life. And it just keeps going. You're just keeping the channels open, folks. That's all you're doing. You're just keeping it open. And you're aware of every little cue that comes along that blocks that channel. The minute that it's there, with an angry thought, it's a judgmental thought, it's a stressful thought, the minute that it shows up, you replace it with an attitude of service, gratitude, generosity, and it leaves. I'd like to close this principle with a, another reading of a wonderful poet whose name is Khalil Gibran, the Lebanese poet who wrote a great collection of, uh, of writings called The Prophet back in 1923, which is still a bestseller today and deserves it. And he wrote on many different subjects, great wisdom. And here, I'd like to share with you what he wrote on self-knowledge. And think about this business of gratitude and generosity and service. And a man said, speak to us on self-knowledge. And he answered saying, your hearts know in silence the secrets of the days and nights. But your ears thirst for the sound of your heart's knowledge. You would know in words that which you would have always known in thought. You would touch with your fingers the naked body of your dreams. And it is well you should. The hidden wellspring of your soul must needs rise and run murmuring to the sea. And the treasure of your infinite depths would be revealed to your eyes. But let there be no scales to weigh your unknown treasure. And seek not the depths of your knowledge with staff or sounding line, for self is a sea, boundless and measureless. Say not, I have found the truth, but rather, I have found a truth. Say not, I have found the path of the soul. Say rather, I have met the soul walking upon my path. For the soul walks upon all paths. The soul walks not upon a line, neither does it grow like a reed. The soul unfolds itself like a lotus of countless petals. Beautiful. Beautiful. Your hearts know in silent the secrets of the days and nights. The part of you that knows, the part of you that is infinite, as the poet suggests, the part of you that is every place, is also in all that you would like to see show up in your life. And if you keep a generous, grateful, serving attitude, you'll never block it. And of course, in miracles, there's a wonderful saying that is a perfect conclusion to this program. And it's a choice that we all have each and every moment of our lives. At every moment that you are alive, you have a choice. The choice is to be either a host to God or a hostage to your ego. You have the choice. God bless you all. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio.